Now the Flyers will pick it up and bring it back. Oh, what a hit by Campbell! Holy mackerel! Campbell stepped into his check in the blue line. Now they're all chasing after Campbell. It's 38 all. Bills can win it here. Wright puts it down. The kick is on the way, and it is good. And the Bills. Tripped up, gets it to May, and over the line. He's May going in on goal. He shoots. He scores! The Buffalo Bills are 1-0, you guys. That's the intro. That's the lead. That's the most important takeaway from week one for the Buffalo Bills against the New York Jets. This is Wagons and Warpaths, your weekly Buffalo sports talk podcast. I am Anthony. I'm the host of this podcast. Find me on Twitter at Wagons underscore Warpaths. Find this podcast on Apple iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. This podcast is officially a contributor to Buffalo Fanatics, officially a part of Project It's. Give me a follow on Twitter. If you like this episode, please rate and review and subscribe to the pod. Tell all your family and friends and loved ones. Sign the blood oath. Hand over the deed to your house. All basic level podcasts, fandom, social media, engagement things like blood oaths and deeds to houses. The Bills are one and oh. That's really the most important thing. As Bill Parcells used to say, you are what your record says you are. Being 1-0 is infinitely better than being 0-1, and that's the most important thing. But within that 1-0, within the Buffalo Bills victory in Week 1 of the 2020 NFL season against the New York Jets, there are some details and some stories. There are some areas where the Buffalo Bills are very good. There are some areas where the Buffalo Bills can definitely improve and definitely get better. And we're going to break down several of those things on both sides of the ball, on both sides of the positive and negative end of the spectrum. We're going to start with Josh Allen. That's how most of this is going to go this season. For all intents and purposes, the discussion the talk, the conversation about the Buffalo Bills this year will center around Josh Allen, for better or for worse. In today's NFL, offense is the headline. Your quarterback is the guy. That's really been how it is for oh a very, very long time. The quarterback is the guy pretty much year in and year out. And if you don't have a quarterback that can get you to the promised land, it's very hard to get to the promised land. Add in a quarterback like Josh Allen, who is very polarizing, who some vehemently believe in and some vehemently doubt and hate and despise. It's crazy. It's interesting. It's fun. But Josh Allen is the focal point of this team. Pretty much no matter what the Buffalo Bills do, Josh Allen is the focal point of this team. And he was the focal point on Sunday. The Buffalo Bills came out and really relied on Allen. In this first game, Josh Allen was 33 of 46 for 312 yards, two touchdowns throwing. He had 14 carries for 57 yards and one touchdown. Just looking at that stat line, Allen did well in this first game. The 33 of 46, that's a 71.7 completion percentage, so basically 72%, which is tremendous. If he finished the year as a 70% completion passer, I'm not one to equate completion percentage with accuracy. I don't think the two equal each other. But it would be nice to see. Even just for the opportunity to get all the doubters, 
off of his back. It would be nice if that stat could continue to live around that level. But Allen looked good. He made good decisions. He checked the ball down. He got the ball in the hands of his playmakers and let them do work. It, it was something that we've talked about on this podcast all throughout the offseason, doing the things that successful quarterbacks in the league have done. Granted, top-level quarterbacks can complete the ball downfield. They make good decisions. They make good reads. But a lot of what they do is, you know, it's first and 10. Let me check it down to my running back who can get four yards or checking it down to this tight end who I know can break a tackle and who's athletic. And so a five-yard completion turns into a 12-yard game. Little things like that. Allen did that a lot in the first half, checking the ball down to Singletary, taking seven yards instead of continuously looking downfield. It helped that he had a tremendous amount of time the offensive line pass protected very well against the Jets. But Allen looked good, especially in the first half. His first 11 completions were completed to seven different wide receivers. He had good poise in the pocket. He avoided the rush very well. He had a play where he avoided Marcus May, who came off the right side of the line as a free rusher, and he stepped inside, kind of like what he did last year against the Giants in Week 2. Avoided the free rusher, made a completion. He... He looked good. The biggest thing for Allen is, for me, his decision-making. I know we talk about the accuracy, and I think that's definitely a part of it, but the decision-making, the taking five instead of looking for 15, knowing, like, okay, it's first down. If I get any gain of four to six yards, that's tremendous because being in second and six or second and four versus second and ten may seem small, but it's a, it makes a world of difference. And Allen did that in this game. What I also thought was interesting in this game, Allen did not have a pass attempt over 25 yards. And that also fit in where Allen kind of left off in 2019. Allen was a tremendous intermediate passer last year. Intermediate defined as being 19 yards or less. He was a top 10 intermediate passer. At one point, he had the fourth best catchable throw percentage in the entire NFL in terms of intermediate passing. You extend that 19 yards to about 25. And Allen really succeeds in that under 30 area. I still want to see what it looks like when he starts to go deeper. But he succeeded in that aspect. They The Bills really came out, worked the intermediate, took advantage of the Jets' weakness, which was their pass coverage and their linebacking core and their secondary. They've lost people to opt-outs, to trades, to injury. They've got new people in the starting lineup, and and I think he had a good game. I think he showed progress from year two to year three. Again, small sample size. It's just one game. But he did have some blemishes on the day. He short-armed the throw to Cole Beasley to start the third quarter on second down. Cole was on the left side of the formation. He ran it out. Allen short-armed it and threw it wide. He also underthrew Cole Beasley on a seam route. It was a completion, but if he would have if he would have put it out there a little more to Cole, Cole catches it and takes it to the house. Well, I don't know. He doesn't have great long distance speed, but he probably takes it for another ten to fifteen yards before he gets tackled. He had that glaring, terrible, horrible miss that has become meme worthy on the internet and on social media to John Brown at the back of the end zone. He didn't get his hips around enough, didn't square his shoulders, and he airmailed it to a wide-open John Brown in the end zone. All he had to do was flick it. He did not. He also underthrew Devin Singletary on a wheel route in the end zone. Singletary was matched up one-on-one on a linebacker, and Allen, Allen put it in a spot where if Singletary was a little bigger, and they talked about it on the broadcast, which I thought was a really insightful point. Allen put it in a spot where if Singletary was bigger, he may be able to go up and get it and win a jump ball battle or just make a wide receiver level style of play and go up and get it. But Singletary's not that tall for that and isn't built like that. And he also had enough, another 10 to 15 yards of room in the end zone roughly. So if Allen just puts it out in front, Singletary can run underneath it because he had the linebacker beat deep. But Allen underthrew that a bit. He had a couple of poor decisions in the red zone in the second half, throwing into some double coverages, making some throws that, to be honest, it was lucky that they weren't intercepted. So his second half was not as strong as his first, but I think holistically, he looked good. You can't sit there and look at that stat line, and stats don't tell the whole story. Numbers can lie. 
So it's not the best thing to just go off of a stat line. But those numbers are good. You know, we talked about so many so many numbers coming into the year of relevance to the Bills and to Josh Allen. And the 300-yard passing mark was one of them. So he gets that monkey off of his back. The completion percentage. It was 58% last year. It was 52% for him in year one. No one talks about how it would have been higher last year if the Bills weren't near top of the league in drops. No one talks about the average depth of target that Allen had last year and how he was always going deep and air yards to sticks and all that kind of stuff. Nobody talks about that. They don't talk about how the offense wasn't really like, oh, let me just dump this off and get a quick, easy completion. They don't talk about that. They just talk about the 58% completion percentage. But for those of us that watch the Bills, we know that although Allen is better completion-wise and accuracy-wise than the completion percentage indicates, we do know that he has the tendency to be inaccurate, to be a bit wild. And I thought in this game, again, for the most part, for the entire game, taking the largest sample size that you can, I thought Allen had a good game. I thought he had a really good game. You can't sit there and see that he had over 360 yards of total offense and three touchdowns. I know he had the two fumbles, and those are very much, very much, very much not ideal. But Allen had a good game, and especially considering there was no preseason, and this is basically everyone's first opportunity to go live against another squad. Because you also got to think of it, too. Not only do you get the preseason, but now it's customary for NFL teams to have the intra-squad scrimmages that they have during training camp. So you pair up with another team, and you go live against another team in practice, and then you also have the preseason. So there's several opportunities throughout the offseason and through the late summer in order to get game ready, in order to get into game flow and rhythm and understand what your team is going to look like when facing off against people who are actually trying to defeat you and actually trying to compete against you. So this was the Bills' first opportunity and first attempt at real live work. And it was important that Josh Allen was good today, and it was good that Josh Allen was good today because the rest of the offense i.e. the running game, was not good. The Bills averaged 3.1 yards per rush today. Devin Singletary and Zach Moss combined for 18 carries for 41 yards. They each had nine carries. The running game did not do tremendously well. And I don't know if that's necessarily a knock on the Bills. The Jets have a good run defense. I know a lot of people like to make fun of the Jets and The talk was how bad they were coming into this year, and Mosley's gone, and Jamal Adams was gone, and even last year they were kind of, not a joke, but they weren't taken seriously, and they were pretty much looked down upon. But the Jets had the number two run defense in the NFL last year. They gave up the second least amount of rushing yards in the entire NFL last year. Greg Williams is a good run-defending defensive coordinator. And the Jets continued that in this game. They made life very difficult for the Bills on the ground, especially for Moss and Singletary. And without Josh Allen really scrambling and without the quarterback design runs, the Bills don't get a lot done on the ground. And I think that also played into the game script and how the offensive play calling went. We saw the Bills come out and go a lot of empty set, a lot of four wides. The the first series, the first play was four wides. They really came out and tried to spread the Jets' defense out. And when you put those two things hand-in-hand, I think it goes with the Bills trying to take advantage of the weaknesses of the Jets' defense, which was their pass coverage. And then also trying to avoid, I guess I'll say for lack of a better term, the Bills trying to avoid the strength of the Jets' defense, which is their run game. I just think that's good that's good coaching, that's good scheming. If you have a team that's really good in this area and not so good in this other area, okay, well, let's do what we can to beat them in the area where they're not so good. It was also roughly the same formula the Bills used last year in week one against the Jets. The Bills came out and went gun, empty set, four wides, and Allen looked great. And then the wheels kind of fell off a little bit in the first quarter with the turnover and then the Cole Beasley drop and bobble that led to the Mosley interception. The Bills shot themselves in the foot, but the Bills came out last year in week one against the Jets, spread them out, and Josh Allen was surgical in week one in the first quarter last year. He carved them up, 
really did good. They just got to the end of the drives, and they either turned it over or they couldn't capitalize and get points. So you looked up on the scoreboard and saw no points, and it looked like those drives were fruitless, but really they were successful. And the Bills came into this game this year, also in week one against the Jets, and really operated with that same mindset. The difference is, this time, the Bills capitalized. They got touchdowns when they got in the red zone in the first half. They were two for two on their first two initial attempts. One, the touchdown run by Allen. The other, the touchdown pass to Zach Moss, where he scrambled and found him open and fit him in there. That was really nice. The Bills in the first half, were a very, very good-looking football team. The Bills in the second half, not a very, very good-looking football team. But that's also going to happen. It's week one of a shortened offseason, no preseason, no scrimmages against other teams, no live action, there's no fans. Stephon Diggs is new to the offense. There's still a sense of teams feeling each other out. And that's not just for the Bills. I think that's for anyone. If you think the way... All these teams are performing this week in week one. If you think that's how they're going to be performing in week five, six, seven, eight, no. That's that's not what it's good. That, that that's not how it is on any regular NFL year, let alone this one. There are teams that are really gonna get into gear, really discover who they are and find a rhythm and find their flow, and week one is not it. But I thought it was very interesting to see what the Bills did and how they came out and attacked the Jets defense. Because it also relates to Brian Dayball, offensive coordinator, play caller, someone who was often criticized last year for his play calling and offensive coordination. And I would include myself in that mix. I thought there were several games where I wanted to see a different set of play calling or I wanted to see a different set of rotation amongst the players or I thought this person didn't see enough snaps, this other person saw too many snaps. So I felt good coming away from this game thinking, you know what? Dayball had a good play called game. I didn't like the amount of quarterback runs that they used just because I'm not genuinely a fan of that. I recognize the structure for it, that it's easier to protect a QB or scheme a little bit when you're calling plays for him to run versus the quarterback scrambling on his own. But I'm not a fan of quarterback design runs in the NFL. Maybe that's just my brain of always going back to what I heard when I was little of thinking like, oh, you know, like the option always works so well in college football. Like how come, you know, NFL teams don't run the triple option? And then it was like, well, because if you did that, your quarterback would get killed because NFL defensive ends and defensive linemen and linebackers would murder your quarterback and it doesn't work like it does in college. Then I also learned the scheme aspect and how it's easier to shut down the triple option in the NFL and scheme and size and all that kind of stuff. But the first rule was because your quarterback will die. And running quarterbacks usually do not survive in the NFL. And calling designed runs literally puts them in harm's way. But with Allen, it's a bit different. He is a weapon. He's our goal line back. He's the short yardage back. It's just, I don't like putting my quarterback in purposefully designed opportunities to get him hit. And then when you add in Allen's propensity for fumbles, that's something that needs to be corrected. But you can also play devil's advocate to that and say, well, if he's on design runs, you know, maybe he's got a better chance of protecting the ball because he knows he's going to run before the play happens versus him dropping back and deciding, oh, shit, I need to take off. So there's two sides to everything. But I'm not a fan of design runs as a general rule of thumb, but I recognize there are exceptions to every rule, but without Allen running, the Bills would have had no offense on the ground. And then speaking of the running game, Cody Ford, someone who I've been, I've been banging the hell out of the Cody Ford to right guard drum all year. I've been doing it since last year, really, but all off season, Cody Ford to guard has been my mantra. If I was a senior in high school and I graduated during the summer, my yearbook quote would have been Cody Ford to right guard. I really think he fits there. I still think he fits there, but he had less than an ideal performance in the running game today. I think the offensive line as a whole performed less than ideal in the running game, but Cody Ford especially. I thought he missed some guys in movement. I thought he didn't lock into his man as, 
I don't want to say as easily as I thought he would, but as easily as I thought he would. I thought his physical presence and mindset and skill set would make up for any mental deficiencies. And I don't say that in terms of, you know, he has a problem picking up the NFL game or learning it, but, you know, you can you can succeed in scheme and you can succeed in physical ability. And I think Cody Ford is a person who can succeed at both, but I thought his physical ability would make up for any lack of success in the scheme ability aspect. And he performed less than ideal. I also think the more reps he gets, he will get better. I still think his ceiling at guard is higher than his ceiling at right tackle. Daryl Williams played pretty good at right tackle. Also struggled a bit in the run game, but to be honest, who really didn't across the offensive line? But I have my eye on that right side a lot, just because Cody Ford to guard means that you have a new starter at right tackle. And then also, at some point, Feliciano is going to come back. So when Feliciano comes back, you could assume that he'll plug back into right guard. So then what happens to Ford? What happens to the right tackle position? So it's an interesting thing to keep an eye on and to keep a thumb on. And then also just to add on to that with the offensive line and pass protection, according to Next Gen Stats, granted there's still two more games to be played on Monday Night Football, so there's four teams left. But as of this moment, Josh Allen is second in the entire NFL in terms of time to throw. The offensive line really protected Allen tremendously in the passing game. Allen sat back. There were several jokes I saw on Twitter in just terms of like, oh, you know, Allen sat back, diagnosed the defense, like made a full Thanksgiving dinner or like built a house and then decided to throw. He had so much time to sit back and read and get comfortable and set his feet. And the offensive line is largely responsible for that. The pass protection was extremely encouraging. Anything that you can do for Josh Allen. He is still a raw prospect. We've talked about it in comparison to the other quarterbacks of his draft class. He has the lowest amount of pass attempts amongst Baker Mayfield, Lamar Jackson, Sam Darnold. There are reps that he will never be able to get back versus those other quarterbacks. He didn't face the level of competition that they faced in college football. So he is still learning. He is still growing. He is still maturing into an NFL quarterback. And I don't, even if Allen kills it this year or if Allen's terrible this year, I still don't think we're seeing a finished Josh Allen product really until, I would say, year five. Once we're in year five, I think we'll really have a firm vision of this is who Josh Allen is. But right now, he's still, he's still got a lot of room to grow. He could grow down. So I guess that wouldn't really be growth, but he could continue to progress or he could falter. He could fall off. There's a lot that is up in the air when it comes to Josh Allen. And so anything that you can do to help him out, like get him a true number one wide receiver or surrounding him with quality NFL weapons or getting him an offensive line that does very well in pass protection, doing any of those things helps him exponentially. And I was very happy, very, very, very happy with the performance of the Bills' offensive line and pass pro today. They did a very good job. I mentioned getting Josh Allen a true number one wide receiver, and as we all know, that is something the Buffalo Bills did this offseason in trading for Stephon Diggs. Diggs looked good today. Nine targets, eight catches on those nine targets, 86 yards. And I think What was more encouraging than just the catch percentage and the yardage total was when those catches came. Diggs had several key catches that extended a drive or came at a part in the game where the Bills needed a first down or they needed some momentum or he made a catch that receivers last year might not necessarily make. He won some matchups in coverage and drew some calls. He did things that We didn't see from the Buffalo Bills offense last year. I love John Brown. I loved what he did today. We're going to talk about him next. But Diggs is a tremendous route runner. His route running ability is something the Bills did not have last year. Cole Beasley is a very good route runner, but he doesn't have that deep threat presence that Diggs has. And Diggs is able to use that even more so to his advantage 
He creates separation. He creates room. His routes are so crisp and so fluid. He snatches the ball out of the air. You know that if the ball gets near him, he's going to come down with it. He looked good. He looked the part of a number one wide receiver. And I think coming into this game, the talk was, what would the Bills offense look like as a whole? We saw that they passed the shit out of the ball. I think game script really dictated that. But part two of that was, if the Bills were going to pass the ball, what would the passing offense look like? Now that the Bills had Stephon Diggs, and knowing Stephon Diggs' history, we'll say, Would Josh Allen force feed him the ball? Would he always be looking towards Diggs? Would he dominate in targets? He did not. John Brown led the team in targets. He had 10 targets, 6 catches for 70 yards, 1 touchdown. Should have had 7 catches for 2 touchdowns if Allen would have completed that horrible misthrow in the end zone to John Brown. Brown looked good, and Brown is someone who is really going to benefit from Stefan Diggs. Talked about it during the offseason. Diggs is going to command some sort of priority in coverage, whether that means the number one corner is on Diggs or it means the number two is on him with safety help over the top or he's just getting general bracket coverage or double coverage. Stefan Diggs is going to command that on a week-in and week-out basis, which means John Brown gets more room to operate by either facing a lesser skilled or lesser talented corner week in week out or facing single coverage either way it's a bonus because he's so fast he can outrun pretty much anyone deep and his route running is underrated I don't think he's as good of a route runner as Stefan Diggs but his route running is definitely not bad his hands aren't bad I don't think he's the total package quality receiver that Diggs is but John Brown is really a tremendous number two and that showed today I thought He looked great on the touchdown, obviously, but he caught that and then just burst up field on the screen. And it was nice to see Diggs blocking for him downfield. Brown had catches all over the field in big moments. It was nice to see that the ball was still going to get spread out. Again, like I mentioned earlier, Allen's first 11 completions were to seven different receivers. That's fantastic. Spreading the ball out, everybody getting a look. Everybody getting a touch, allowing people to get into rhythm and get into the flow of the game early, not staring someone down and force-feeding it to anyone. That's very, very good. And with the Bills' offense, they have weapons. Diggs, Brown, Beasley, Knox, the running backs. They've got weapons. They've got options. Gabe Davis looked good. I know he only had two targets and two catches, but I liked what he did, snatching the ball out of the air, getting some yards after catch. It was good to see that The Bills' offense isn't going to be, well, you know, they passed it 46 times and Diggs got 20 targets. Now, I'm okay if Diggs gets 20 targets and he comes up with like 19 catches, but usually if you're forcing something that much to one person, it can have somewhat negative repercussions. And I say that thinking in my head the day that Devontae Adams had and the day that DeAndre Hopkins had and the days that Michael Thomas had every single day and every single week last year in 2019 for the Saints. But it was good to see that Allen's able to spread the ball out in terms of just confidence in himself and not feeling like he has to go towards this person, but also just being able to read the defense, Dayball being able to scheme up things for everyone to give everybody a bit of a taste. And it was nice to see John Brown leading the team in targets. I don't think that was a thing most people would have expected coming into this game. I don't know if it's what we're going to see week in and week out, and I think with what the Bills did on offense against the Jets today, I think a lot of what the Bills are going to do week in and week out is going to be based on their opponent, which I really, really like. Bill Belichick has been doing that for years. We would see week in and week out on the offense, someone else would have a different impact and a great game week after week. It might be Gronk this week. It might be Julian Edelman next week. It might be this running back this week. It might be the third string running back the next week. It might be the fullback the week after that, so on and so forth. Belichick would take advantage of your weaknesses and build his game plan and structure for that week around what you would have a hard time defending. And if the Bills are on that path, then I think who dominates in targets and who dominates the stat line week in and week out could have variation. I shouldn't even say dominates the targets because, again, Brown had 10 Diggs had nine. It was a good 
target share for the offense as a whole. And it was nice to see the top two receivers for the Bills both get involved early, both stay involved throughout the game and see the impact that they had. My favorite throw of the game, just this last note on Brown, my favorite throw was the third down in the fourth quarter. Brown was covered tight. He ran a hook, and Allen put it beautifully on his outside shoulder, away from the corner, somewhat low, so that it was just going to go to Brown. The corner didn't have a good shot at it. It was a nice, nice pinpoint throw. It was on an important third down. The next play was the one where Diggs ran the drag uh, in the intermediate part of the field, and Allen just flicked it up and dropped it right into the basket, and Diggs had about a 20-yard catch. John Brown stopped his route on the side of the field where Diggs caught it, and then Diggs got popped. They talked about that on the broadcast, which I also thought was a very good point. But those were two really, really, really nice completions. They might be my favorite two completions of the game, with the Diggs one being number two. My favorite one was to John Brown, and I think that's a testament to, one, Allen's ability to recognize the situation and have accuracy at times, but two, John Brown and him having that link up, having that connection. They developed good chemistry last year, and it's nice to see that that has continued going into 2020 and that the addition of Stephon Diggs hasn't changed that. We switch to the other side of the ball. Matt Milano and Tremaine Edmonds. I know we haven't heard the official diagnosis for either of these gentlemen. Some reports have come through about Edmonds that after the game, he wasn't in a sling, he had no ice on his shoulder, that he looked fine. There are some reports that him coming out may have just been, listen, the game is in hand, we don't need you to go back in, don't worry about it. That's very good. Milano, there have been some mixed reports. He tried to play through the injury to the hammy. I saw it right away. He forced Crowder out of bounds, and then he kind of like overstepped with his right leg and almost like slid a little bit, and I was like, oh, that looked awkward. And he kind of gingerly jogged back onto the field from the Jets' sideline. Then the camera cut away to show a replay of the play. Came back, Milano was still on the field. Milano then makes the tackle on the next play and immediately gets up, goes to the sideline, and calls in to have someone else come in. Edmonds then leaves after he misses the tackle on the Jamison Crowder 69-yard touchdown. And so you're sitting there, and all of a sudden your two stud linebackers are both out, and you're sitting there with Tyrell Dodson and A.J. Klein, who I thought played well considering what was expected of them. A.J. Klein is a really, really good backup option to have. I think his play when he was in Carolina was overlooked. I think his play on the Saints was a little more high profile, but he was still overlooked given the rest of the playmakers on that defense, but on the team as a whole. He's a really good third option to have. He's solid. He's not going to come in and lose you the game or screw up too much. Dodson was more of a wild card, but I thought he played well as well. But I'm very worried about Milano and Edmonds. Linebacker is a position where the Bills are very, 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 very top heavy. You got Milano, and you got Edmonds, and then everyone else is basically everyone else. Milano and Edmonds are both B-pluses or A-minuses, or one is one, one is the other. Either way, you got a couple A-minuses or a couple B-pluses, and then everyone else is maybe a B or a C-plus, C-minus, C. They don't have a lot of room for error at linebacker. And with the Buffalo Bills basically playing nickel, as their base formation. They played it over 70% of the time last year. Nickel is the base formation. I know they're a 4-3 defense, but they're really a nickel defense. First defensive play of the game against the Jets, the Bills were already in nickel. Taron Johnson is basically a starter. That's their formation. That's their go-to. Part of the reason why they are so successful in that, as I've stated all offseason, is because Milano and Edmonds can blitz. They can cover. They're rangy. They can do so many things that allow you to play nickel as your base defense. And in today's NFL, with how pass-happy and pass-heavy so many offenses are, you need your linebackers to be rangy and be able to cover and be able to be multifunctional. Milano and Edmonds are both that. Seeing them go down has me worried. I'm still very worried, but we'll see what happens with both of those. Andre Roberts had a fantastic day. Averaged 14 yards of return. He looked really good. Changed field position multiple times. I was very happy with that. Special teams are one-third... Of the game, it was very surprising to a lot of people when he got cut. 
last week, and then I was like, oh, it's not. He's not really cut. He's actually going to come back. I know some people didn't want him on the roster. They thought McKenzie could be the returner or someone else could be a returner, Robert Foster potentially, but Andre Roberts really earned his money in this game. He flipped field position so much, had solid returns, got the Bills sideline pumped up, got the offense pumped up. He did really well. A couple other notes from this game. The Bills' possession numbers in this game. The Bills had the ball for 41 minutes and 16 seconds compared to the Jets' 18 minutes and 44 seconds. To have that much possession and that much ball control when you pass the ball 46 times, that's tremendous. That's another feather in the cap to the play calling, but also a feather in the cap to Josh Allen. For anyone who wants to meme his overthrow to John Brown or make jokes or whatever. The Bills don't have that ball control if Allen's not completing the football. If you're throwing incompletions, the clock is stopping. You're not building continuity, and the clock isn't running. You don't have that kind of possession if you're not maintaining continuity on offense. And yes, I know the defense played a role in those possession numbers as well with all the three and outs that they forced and the turnovers that they had. But the offense did very well in the ball possession department. And when you're passing the ball 46 times, this wasn't a, yeah, the Bills had the ball for over 40 minutes because they ran the ball 50 times and only passed it 17. No, they came out and passed the shit out of the ball as their primary means of gaining yardage and scoring. And they had over 40 minutes of possession. That's a very, very encouraging thing to see, especially this early on in the year. And I don't care that the Jets are bad and I don't care that it's against a quote-unquote bad team that's good regardless. You're playing starters in the NFL and you were able to pass the ball as your primary mode of moving the sticks and gaining points and you had the ball for over 40 minutes. Very good. Also very good, the play of the defensive line. They were active. They were aggressive. They caused chaos. Not a ton of sacks, but they got good pressure. They got Darnold off of his spot. They made him feel uncomfortable. They changed his arm angle several times, made him move his feet, gave him happy feet a bit in the pocket knocked him out of his drop point several times, changed the angle in which he was going to drop back and where he was going to set his feet. They really did a good job in this game. Having the rotation that they have and seeing Quentin Jefferson and seeing Jerry Hughes again be a terror on the edge. Trent Murphy looked good today. Ed Oliver, I know he didn't show up on the stat sheet a ton, but he did good creating pressure in the middle of the field. Harrison Phillips looked very good in his first game back. I'm even more excited to see what the defensive line will look like when Butler's good to go, which will hopefully be for next week. But the defensive line looked as advertised. They arguably have the deepest defensive line in the NFL, top to bottom, and that's without having a stud or a bona fide star on the defensive line. No pun intended, because star opted out. But they looked very good today. That's a strength of this team. That's a strength of the defense, and it'll be nice to potentially have that unit to be able to hang the Bills' hat on week in and week out on defense. They looked very good. Levi Wallace also looked very good. This is something I was very nervous about, cornerback depth. I've been speaking about it all offseason, even more so going into this game when Josh Norman was put on IR. Once you have Trey, once you have Levi, you really don't have anything else after that in terms of outside corners. Next up is Cam Lewis, who was called up from the practice squad. You don't have a lot of known commodity at the outside corner position. So Trey and Levi need to play well. And Levi played well. He was good in coverage. He was even better in the running game. His tackling has been suspect for his first couple of years in the league. But he had a couple good tackles on Le'Veon Bell earlier in the game. And I know Bell fell forward and ran through him a bit. But Levi wrapped up, got his man down, and he's given up. He's given up weight to Le'Veon Bell. Levi's a skinny guy. He's rangy in terms of his body and how he's built. He's lanky, but he's not a thick guy by any means. He's not a bruiser. He stuck his nose in, came in with good form, made an effort, showed up in the running game, and just showed up in the tackling game in general. I was very happy with that as well. One last little note and point to hit on. The Sam Darnold interception, the Matt Milano interception, that play was such a beautiful play, one by Milano for the athleticism and being able to come down with the ball, but to the scheme. Darnold throws that ball, and he underthrows it, which allows Milano to go up and get it. But the reason he underthrows it is because Micah Hyde is perfectly over the top. Darnold has nowhere to go with that throw, because if he goes too deep, Micah Hyde's going to pick it off 
or Pop Crowder. If he goes too short, Milano's going to pick it like he did. Darnold would have had to make an absolutely perfect throw in order to complete that pass, which is a tough thing to do for anyone, but especially Sam Darnold. He did not. It got picked off. That play is, as a whole, a microcosm of the Buffalo Bills defense. The front four generating pressure, knocking Darnold off of his spot, making him move his feet, making him roll out to a side he doesn't want to roll out to, making him force a throw, and then the coverage being set up so well and schemed so well, and the coverage team getting to their spots, reading the play correctly, playing in sync, playing in tandem with one another, and creating a turnover. That was arguably my favorite play of the game. I know that may seem a bit ridiculous. I mean, I'm a defense guy. I like defense. But that's something that we're going to see it and see, oh, what a play by Milano. But there were so many things that worked well to set that interception up. And it was capped off by Milano's really athletic play and awesome hands and good interception. But holistically, if you look at that, there were so many things that worked. And it's a it's a really good example of how well coached the Buffalo Bills defense is. Sean McDermott, Leslie Frazier, the whole individual position coaches as well. The Buffalo Bills defense is well coached, and that's something that we need to see to continue this year. The Bills defense played tremendous last year. We can't afford to have any downtick from them in 2020. And if they continue to play at a high level against everyone, the Bills have a really good shot, much like they did last year, especially if you combine that with a seemingly improved Josh Allen here in year three. Buffalo Bills are one to know, you guys. That's it. On to Miami, hopefully on to 2-0 after the Bills go to Miami next week. Thank you for riding with me on this episode. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Wagons and Warpaths. If you did, please, please rate and review and subscribe to the podcast. Tell all your family and friends and loved ones. Give me a follow on Twitter. Again, the Twitter handle is Wagons underscore Warpaths, or you can just search Wagons and Warpaths. I come up, give me a follow on Twitter. I'm pretty active on Twitter, especially in the evenings, not so much during the day. I don't do that while I'm at the day job that pays the bills. But give me a follow on Twitter. Please rate and review and subscribe to the pod. I hope you like this episode. I hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all staying safe. I hope you enjoyed the game today. I hope you enjoy the game next week. I will not be doing an episode next week after the Miami game because I have a wedding to go to, and that wedding that I am going to is mine. I'm getting married. So no episode next week. I'll see you the week after, after week three. Thank you for riding with me on this episode, and I'll see you two weeks from now.